welcome back everybody. In this video, we are going to talk about photography using smartphones. Now, I have this little project that I've been working on pretty much all summer now. And if you follow me on Instagram, I really haven't made a big deal about it, but pretty much with a few exceptions, every image that I've taken over the last three months has been using cell phones. So they say that the best camera is the one that you have with you, and I totally agree with that. And if you look at the way our industry has changed over the last few years, DSLR sales have been on this declining slope. Mirrorless are this bright spot little thread, but that's not exactly proven yet. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that most people, particularly enthusiasts, their phone is good enough. And this is something that I've really, I mean, my relationship with my phone, I'm an iPhone user. I have been for a number of years now, and I don't really look at my phone as something to be used for more serious photography. And I realize that the iPhone definitely has some limitations, particularly when you start getting into low light, it just does not perform that well. But some of the results that I've seen people getting from other smartphones has led me down this theory where I want to really check out the landscape and see what's available. So I have been shooting a lot over the last three months with three different smartphones. I have the iPhone XX Max, which is the phone that I use day to day. I've also had a Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus, as well as a Google Pixel 3. Now I will be doing some more specific videos over the coming weeks on the various phones that I've been using. But I wanted to establish kind of a baseline video today because it's actually really interesting to me, as much as I've talked to friends and colleagues, how few people understand what is actually going on in your smartphone when it comes to the camera. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at Skillshare.com. If you haven't seen Skillshare, you should check them out. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes on photography, film production, design, and many other creative fields. A premium membership will give you unlimited access to high quality classes from experts in their fields. You can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work that you love. So I'll give you an example of a course that I think is outstanding. This is Dale McManus, iPhone Photography, How to Take Pro Photos on Your Phone. What I love about this the most is it is not really limited to iPhone. And as Dale says in here, he thinks of this process is kind of 10% gear and the rest of it's really your brain. And if you go through the list here and see what he's teaching, it's mostly about shot composition, vantage point, rule of third, creating depth, things that are just really important that could be applied to any smartphone or any camera technology. So if you want to get used to this whole concept of just shooting with your phone, I think this is an awesome place to start. Skillshare is also one of the most affordable learning platforms out there. An annual subscription costs less than $10 a month. So if you head over to Skillshare using the link below in the description, you can get a two month free trial. So you've got absolutely nothing to lose or even purchase. So just go check out Skillshare today by using that link in the description. And when give a special shout out and thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode of The Art of Photography. So let's talk about how photography works in context with a smartphone. Now, there are three basic elements that go into this equation. I think the first two most people are really familiar with. The first two elements are you have a lens and you have a sensor. And in a traditional model of a more proper camera, such as a DSLR or even a mirrorless system, we have interchangeable lens systems. And basically what this means is that you can take a lens, and I love prime lens, is because they have wide apertures and I can change that lens out for a different focal length and I use the same sensor. So that's the model that most of us are familiar with with bigger camera systems is that we can change the lens out but we use the same sensor for every image that we take. Now on a smartphone there are no moving parts so pretty much every time that you see a lens you can be rest assured that there is a sensor sitting underneath it. So if we take something like the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus on this side of the camera we have three lenses and we have three different focal lengths. Each one of them has a sensor that corresponds with it. And as you can see by the size, they are all very small. So this is a fundamental challenge physically with a smartphone. You have a tiny lens, which does not give you a very big depth of field, and you have a small sensor, which does not really give you the optimum low light performance that you want. So we have our tiny lens, we have our tiny sensor, and this brings me to the third part of how imaging is done on a smartphone. And this is a concept that is known as computational imaging. Now I know this is a a really academic sounding term. What is computational imaging? Computational imaging is basically a fancy term of being able to utilize the computer part of your phone with a series of algorithms that will hopefully overcome some of the shortcomings that you have with having a very small lens and a very small sensor. So I think some of these most people are pretty familiar with. If you shoot in low light, you're using a higher ISO. And so what happens is you're going to start to introduce more noise into the image, particularly 
in the shadow areas. So you might have an algorithm that comes in that starts to look at those shadow areas to delete and smooth out a lot of that noise that's introduced. You might have a second algorithm that in turn comes in and attempts to sharpen the image. And in most cases with phones, unfortunately, those algorithms over sharpen images, but the idea is that it is going to overcome or balance out some of the shortcomings that you have with the smaller lens and smaller sensor configuration. Now those are pretty basic applications of this idea of computational imaging and we've come much further than that in the last five years and I think clearly the leaders in this space are Google. This is a Google Pixel 3, and if you followed at all what Google are doing in this space, they have an entire team of people that work specifically on these academic projects of ideas, experiments, things that they can do, and when one of these peaks, it works its way into their phone. And this year we saw the addition of Night Sight, which I think is one of the biggest representations of what you can do with computational imaging. So the way that it works is you select the Night Sight mode on your Google Pixel 3, and you're going to compose your shot as soon as you you hit the shutter that's where the behind the scenes work starts coming into play the first thing it does is it measures how steady you're holding the phone if you had a lot of coffee today or is this actually on a tripod and accordingly it's going to adjust to how many exposures it can make and so after a couple of seconds it's going to take a series of exposures it's going to use the OIS in the lens the optical image stabilization it's going to stitch these together into the same configuration and what it's going to do is it's going to take the best part of these images to composite into a single image in the end and so the way this works is really mind-blowing because what I've discovered in my use with night sight is not only does it work in extreme low light where it's going to bring out colors that maybe um, are hard to bring out with a normal exposure it's going to bring out a sharpness that you're not going to get hand holding an image but even in situations where a lot of things are moving one of the most impressive parts for me is that it is going to either blur or remove images so for instance if somebody's walking through the image as you take multiple images they're going to show up in different spaces in between each image and the way night sight works is this wonderful way of stitching it together and giving you an in composite that either only has the person in one space or it has a blur if they're moving and so it has a really intelligent way of looking at that if you guys are interested in learning more on this i have two links in the show description one is to an interview with two of the people on the team that my colleagues over at dp review have done and the other is to the google ai blog as well because they keep track of a lot of open projects that they've got on there right now. A lot of them have to do with resolution and how you can use OIS within the camera and composite exposures to actually get a bigger image in the end. And I think they're really doing some of the best work in this field right now. So check those out if you were interested. The other amazing thing about Google is that it does all this with essentially one lens. Which brings me to the great frustration in my three month experiment here of shooting pretty much exclusively on phones, which is this software layer. And some of it's well written, some of it is not as well written written and with any kind of imaging if you've been shooting on serious cameras you probably know the difference of shooting with raw files versus JPEG files. Now it's not an issue of the file format and I'm not going to go into that argument here but when you have a JPEG file it's largely dependent on what the processor has burned into its interpretation of that final image. If you have a raw format it leaves that interpretation up to you in post-processing. So for instance exposure is the biggest one and I think it's probably the largest frustration among photographers. If you have a JPEG file in the end that has blown highlights, you won't get any of that data back. It is blown. It's gone. Same with losing shadow detail. You can bring it up a little bit, but because the JPEG is compressed and so small, you're not going to have the flexibility with those files that you do have with RAW files. Now, the other big thing for me is most cameras now tend to, in smartphones anyway, tend to overprocess their JPEGs in terms of sharpening. So you end up with images that are way sharper than what they should be, and you're going to notice this in fine types of detail. So leaves and trees, uh, hair for instance, anything where there's really small items that are going to render themselves out. And I know that all these companies do it because enthusiasts don't really care about those things. They're just going to see a quote-unquote sharp image that they're going to glance at for a few seconds and send to a friend or share on social media. And I think that's a very frustrating point for me is because I don't want stuff over sharpened in the end. I want to have a level of control over that. And it gets even more weird because the UIs are built, and this is not a bad thing, but they're 
they're built in a way so you don't have to think about that. And I'll use a case here, which is the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus. Now this has three cameras with three different sensors. And the configuration on here is such that you can tell it that you want to save a RAW file, but you're limited into what you can shoot with to save that RAW file. So for instance, RAW files are only available in the professional mode in the camera, which basically does not allow you to switch lenses. So you don't have access to the wide angle. You don't have access to the telephoto lens. That can be somewhat frustrating for, I think, for a lot of people, myself included. Another weird glitch in the Samsung Galaxy S10 is that the telephoto lens has a smaller f-stop and it has a lot to do with the physical design of the lens. I believe it's a 2.4. And so if the phone determines that you do not have enough light for it to deal with the noise with, it just shuts that camera off and then moves to a digital zoom from the normal lens. And it doesn't really tell you that. You have to discover that. And it thinks that that's the better look. It doesn't matter what you're going for. And so those are some things that are very frustrating. I really would like to have a camera phone that will give me raw files from the wide angle, the normal, and the telephoto. Of course, the Huawei P30 and P30 Pro will do that. But the Huawei has problems with the RAW files because like we're talking about all this computational imagery and where does that happen? Does it happen before the RAW file is written? In some cases, yes, like the Nokia 9 or even the Google Pixel 3. And in some cases, no, like the Huawei P30 and P30 Pro. So another thing that I want to mention is this whole idea of computational imaging is open to third-party app developer support. And we've seen some of it, not enough, I think, but there are some ways to do it. Now, the way I've been using all of these phones so far is I use the native camera app where at all possible. That creates a problem on things like the iPhone because even though the iPhone has raw support, you will only get it through a third-party app. And so for that reason, I've used Lightroom Mobile on all of these phones for two reasons. One, I can take raw images definitely, probably only using one lens, but it can be done. And the second reason is I can sync all of these images up into the Lightroom ecosystem. I have a whole video on that. I will link in the show description as well. And then also another thing that's really nice about that is I am able to use presets that I've written and all of the presets that I've used are publicly available. I will link up to those in the show description. So if you want to be able to use Lightroom presets on your phone too, you may do so. Check out the link below. Now, obviously, smartphones are not going to replace traditional cameras in a professional setting. For instance, if I showed up to shoot a wedding with nothing but my phone, even though I could probably get some great images with it, it probably wouldn't be the most professional looking way to go. So I don't think they're going to totally replace the camera industry as we know it. But it's really amazing some of the things that we're starting to see. And what I think the more important question is, is with this whole idea of of computational imaging being able to make up for shortcomings, whether that's the look of bokeh, whether that's image resolution, whether that's low light shooting, when and or what point are we going to start seeing these on more professional camera systems? Because I think, you know, if we look at the next five years, five years in the digital world is a long time. In fact, let me give you a little bit of context. When I started making videos for this channel, I started 10 years ago. And at the time I was using a Canon camcorder that used Super 8 tape. Well, it wasn't Super 8, but it was a digital tape that you would put into this. You would do all your filming and then I would have to ingest all that footage, which had to happen in real time over a firewire connection. And then you'd have to de-interlay it because it was done for this kind of old school TV. So you'd have to run that through a render. Then you had this perfect 1080p footage that you could, like, anyway, everything took forever to, to render, to edit, to upload. And now I can tell you that something that I have in my pocket now, particularly with the iPhone and particularly with access to third party apps like LumaFusion for video editing, I've got not only 10 times more power, I've got one tenth of the size and I've got 10 times the image quality as what I was able to do when I started this 10 years ago. It's a lot of tens. Anyway, this is where I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear your thoughts on this. And if there's anything you'd like me to cover in terms of smartphones and cameras in the future, I would like to know. So leave your comment below. I will see you guys in the next video. Until then, later.